love endured our shame, anger, and guilt. He was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter. But it is by his wounds that we are healed. He made a way for our brokenness to become holiness. Without Good Friday, there would be no good news. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice and for your love. Well, good morning, Freedom. How's everybody out there this morning? Oh, my goodness. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing today? Happy Resurrection Day. We're so glad you guys decided to join us today on Easter. If you'll go ahead and stand with us. We're getting ready to get started, but I just want to say thank you guys for showing up today. Uh, today is a, a happy day that we plan to celebrate just a little bit today. So if you've got Jesus in your heart today, this should be a great day for you guys. This first song we're going to do is called The Old Rugged Cross. Y'all know this. Sing it out with us. Someday for a crown. 
This next song is called King of Kings. When we get to this last verse, this last verse is absolutely what this day is about. It's by his blood, we are saved today, guys. Today is the finished work of the cross. The day that the tomb rolled open and was found to be empty because our Savior was not there. He was alive today. This may be the saddest, happiest week in all of human history. And we're here today together, celebrating it because of that cross. So today as we sing this song, guys, the King of Kings, that's what today is about. The King of Kings has risen today. So you guys, sing it with everything you got. In the darkness we were waiting without Without light, to whom heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin king the world from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt. i 
cross working for that empty tomb this morning lord we love you so much god we thank you for giving us this opportunity to sing and praise your name on such a wonderful day lord thank you and i pray that this message will be soothing to you god and bring joy to you god we pray this and we love you and we pray all of it in jesus holy precious and most importantly risen name today father we love you amen you guys can be seated for a moment
There's a God who leads. There's a God who bleeds. Oh, praise the one who would reach for me. Hallelujah to the Son of Jesus really rose from the dead. Why is Christianity different than the rest of religion? How do you know there is a why God? Why do horrible things If I've been following Jesus for so people. long, why How am I still so I believe broken? In if I'm a good enough person, I know the isn't that why would a God that created the heavens and the universe? How do you why do you why do so many terrible things? Other people are trying to but I don't really Well, happy Resurrection Sunday to you. Happy Easter. And for all of you that are joining us online, thank you for being a part of our church family today. And so why don't you give yourselves a hand for being here on the greatest day ever. Amen. 
Hey, join me in your Bibles, if you would. Grab your Bible, if it's in a Bible form like this, a paperback, or uh, maybe it's in electronic form. That is fine as well. But if you'd grab that and join me in John chapter 11. John chapter 11. I want to speak to you this morning about the title, Christ is Risen, This Changes Everything. Christ is Risen, and This Changes Everything. If you know Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know you have been changed from the inside out. You may look the same, but you know spiritually you are not the same. Can I hear an amen right there? I'm so thankful that Christ is alive. On Friday, we had a great, good Friday. And if you weren't here for the service, I want to tell you, we had a great, great celebration and service declaring the truth of the cross and what it means. There was great music. There was great drama and uh, certainly a great word from God. But I'm so thankful for Good Friday But I'm more grateful that there's an empty tomb today. I'm so thankful that no matter where you go in Jerusalem, no matter if you tour where the empty tomb is, the place of the skull as known as Golgotha, we know that it is empty. And so I'm thankful for all the help. Thank you, Ms. Crystal. Thank you, our drama team, our worship team. Uh, Thank you for our production team. Thank you to our actors, many who were reluctant to do it until they realized they had no lines, and then they gladly volunteered. So to you who are brave, uh, no-word soldiers, we are thankful for you, and uh, I'm glad that you started your acting career, and we look forward to having you to be a part of more in the future. But today, John chapter 11, Christ is risen This changes everything. The Bible declares in a very straightforward manner that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he is alive today. In your handout, that's the statement. And on the screen, I want to repeat that statement. The Bible declares in a very straightforward manner, it gives facts This is not a subjective truth, by the way. This is objective truth. See, subjective truth, which means basically there is no truth and it's whatever someone feels or whatever someone thinks, that's not true. This is objective truth. And the fact that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead, not only that he died and that he was buried, but that he rose again the third day, is factual. We are going to look at some biblical facts today to prove, and if you are a doubter, if you are a skeptic, welcome. We're glad that you're here. We take that. We are welcoming that. We embrace that because we want to answer that, and we believe that we can. And so many of you, maybe some of you who are watching right now, are kind of on the fence about this whole thing. You've heard it. You maybe even seen it in a drama But you need hard evidence. You're not alone. There are many in the Bible who needed evidence. I wanted evidence. There's an individual and many in the Bible. Thomas wanted evidence. He declared, I'm not going to believe unless I see it. As a matter of fact, he he wasn't even there the first time that Christ appeared after his resurrection to the disciples, he wasn't even there because he thought all of them were a bunch of lunatics. And then he showed up the second time, which we know Jesus asked for him, wanted to know where he was. Jesus came a second time to these men. We'll talk about that. But the fact is, he showed up a second time and he looked right at Thomas and said, Thomas, see and feel. Now, you don't see and feel a person who didn't exist. You don't see and feel a person that's just a figment of your imagination. You don't see and feel, and by the way, they ate with him. You don't do those things if the person didn't exist. And Thomas touched 
the wounds of Jesus. See, the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ was crucified, and it even names the place. It names the place, as I mentioned earlier, Golgotha's Hill. That's the place. It's just outside of Jerusalem. It is from the word cronium, which we get our English word cranium, which means if you go there and visit, you can look at it, and it's called the place of the skull. It looks just like a skull. Jesus rose from the dead bodily, and after three days and three nights, the Bible declares that he was alive. Jesus Christ walked the earth, seen by multitude of witnesses, for 40 days. Jesus Christ then at that moment ascended to heaven and took an exalted position at the right hand of the Father Almighty, God Almighty, and again, eyewitnesses saw him ascend. So the question is, did the resurrection of Christ really happen? Or was it all a big fraud or just a conspiracy at the time? And if Christ is risen, then it changes everything. And I want to declare to you today on authority of God's word, not mine, not any denomination, not some religious system, but based on God's word, Christ is risen. For you who are believers, that was awfully weak. This is your banner day. This is the moment. This is the day. This is everything. This is the crown jewel of why we exist and what we believe in and what we put our faith in and hope in. Christ is risen. Amen. There we go. Now the church showed up. But you know, maybe if we could take you back there, maybe you're just like, where the disciples were. We kind of are a little hard on them. The fact is, the disciples weren't even there except one. The disciples were hiding, telling no one about Jesus and his death, proclaiming not his resurrection because they couldn't believe that he died. So when they saw him actually get crucified, then the natural thought, as you see someone die on a cross, the natural thought would be, well, this is it. This is over. It was a good run we had, Jesus. I heard what you said. Man, we loved the teaching. Man, those miracles were awesome. We loved the healing of the lame, the blind, and the deaf. And yes, we loved all of those things. And that was wonderful. And that's historical. And that was amazing. But you're dead. And the moment they came and arrested Jesus, Jesus at the Garden of Gethsemane, all of the people scattered. And I understand why even today people can be skeptical, having doubts. After all, this is a big deal for someone to make a claim, I'm going to die, they're going to bury me, and guess what? Guess what? I'm going to rise again on the third day. If I was to say that, and you can feel free to participate, if I was to say to you, hey guys, guess what? On Wednesday, I'm going to rise from the dead, so today after the service, I'm going to die, but on Wednesday, guess what? I'm going to come alive again. How many of you would believe me? Oh, no takers. Why won't you believe me? Jesus said the same thing. People didn't believe him. However, Jesus saying it is very different from me saying it. Jesus made good on his proclamation. Jesus fulfilled his promise. That is the difference maker. You can only put your faith and trust in someone if they make a promise. A promise is only as good as the person who makes the promise. And so if the person never fulfills the promise, then they're not worth believing. Here's the thing. The resurrection of Christ is not simply, it's not simply a 
philosophical idea whereby the Holy Spirit lives only in our memories. It's only a good idea. He only lives in our thoughts. See, this whole fact of Jesus being raised from the dead is a reality of history. You can prove it. You could go into any court of law, and you could use what's called the laws of authenticity. The laws of authenticity. And you could go into those courts, and you can validate any historical event, apply the same rules of the laws of authenticity to the resurrection of Christ, and come away with historical certainty that he, Christ, was raised from the dead. So here's the thing. We're not asking you to come to the table without any doubts, any skepticism. We're not asking you to come without any hesitation, just believe whatever comes out, because that's not reality. The reality is what you need is facts. That's what you need. There was a man by the name uh, of Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was um, an investigative journalist for the Chicago Tribune. His wife became a Christian. Lee Strobel, who only desire as an investigative journalist, was to only print and write out for the Chicago Tribune only those things which were factual and could be proven. When his wife became saved, Lee began on a big journey because this thing upset him. He was upset about this. It really angered him that his wife had become a Christian. He wanted nothing to do with this because he'd heard these stories, but he did not believe. He was an atheist. So Lee stepped out and said, you know what? What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this whole narrative and I'm going to take this whole story and I'm going to take every person that I can get in contact with, uh, uh, philosophers, scholars. I'm going to reach out to all the people that have these PhDs, all these people that have made these claims and believe them. I'm going to go to all of them and I'm going to eradicate this once and for all. And I'm going to prove that Jesus Christ was maybe a good person and yes, maybe existed, but I'm going to prove once and for all through facts that Jesus Christ is dead and he didn't rise from the dead and all of this is just a joke. Lee Strobel wrote a book in 1998. That book is well known today and is still in popular circulation and that book is known as The Case of for Christ. It's not only the book he wrote. He wrote a lot of books. He wrote the uh, book called The Case for Easter. He wrote another book, um, uh, uh, Claims That God Made, Outrageous Claims That God Makes. He wrote several many, and in 2017, a movie finally came out uh, about that book, The Case for Christ, called the case for Christ. And what we found out is that through his investigative work, through his intensive study, through biblical search and historical documents, Lee Strobel did not prove anything except that what the Bible said was true. And Lee Strobel himself became convinced that all the facts pointed to one thing, Christ is risen. If you don't have that book, you ought to, write, you ought to read that book. He has many other books for kids, for, you, uh, for teens, that all typify this thing, that there is absolute historical and biblical documentation that verifies that Christ is alive. Here's what I want to say to you. Some people will debate, and that is fine. Feel free to do that. Let's engage some people will debate what the resurrection means and what the Bible means. Not a problem with that. But you cannot deny 
the facts of it. You can debate what it may mean, but you cannot deny the facts of it. Lee Strobel said, listen, there's one thing about all this evidence that is here in scriptures and that I found, and he writes in his book, he said, there's one thing that concludes the matter. If I am wrong, you have nothing to worry about. But if I'm right, you've got everything to be concerned about. So my friend, are you wanting to just kind of balance this whole thing, maybe straddle the fence a little bit, trying to figure out, well, I'm just going to base it on my truth. No, my friend, that's subjective truth. You need to base it on facts. So you need to prove to us that he isn't, is, isn't risen, as I'm going to prove to you today that he is risen. And so it's important for us to look at that. So if we could today, let's together, you at home and you that are here, let's consider some facts about the empty tomb that changes everything. Let's do that today. So what we're going to do, if you can help me now, I don't know about you, but I love investigation stories. I love cold case files. I love that kind of stuff. I eat it up. I do. I'm obsessed with it. You want to know why? Because only the facts matter. Everybody wants to have subjective truth, and everybody wants to have a feeling, and everybody wants to base the way that they live by their feelings. I mean, that's wonderful, but it doesn't change reality. And the truth is, I need it because it's the only thing that frees me. So if everyone is truthful, then how can we live consistently that way? You can't. So it's important for us to base our life on what the Bible says. And so let's be an investigator today. And let's look at some facts. I'm going to share four facts with you today very quickly about the empty tomb and that Christ being risen changes everything. Here it is. You're going to want to jump right in. Let's just go. We're going to get right into the handout, and it'll be on the screen for you at home. The first fact is this. Christ exhibited total power over life and death. Christ exhibited total power over life and death. Now, I'm not going to look up all those verses, but I am going to reference many of them, but we are going to look up some as we go through this. The first one comes from Mark chapter 5. In Mark chapter 5, Christ gave life to a ruler's daughter that was dead. Dead. Not fainted. Not proposed dead, but dead. Not weak. Dead. This man was not a disciple of Christ, but a ruler of the synagogue in Israel. According to Luke chapter 7, another fact is Christ gave life to a widow's son. By the way, this funeral was in procession. They were carrying the dead body, and Jesus shows up. I love that because when Jesus shows up, everything that's dead is made alive. Now, here's the thing. We're not talking about physical death, although we're giving reference to this. I want you to know that everyone dies of physical death. Jesus did not come just so that you could have physical life forever. By the way, everyone will have physical life forever. We have gotten the language wrong, so let me help correct it here. Because we're biblical thinkers, we're a Bible church. The fact is, do you want to live forever? That's the wrong question. Do you want to have eternal life? The fact is, you are going to have eternal life. The destination is the question of where you will spend it. It's not a question, do you want to live forever? The question is, do you want eternal everlasting life with Jesus? Or do you want eternal life separated from the love of Christ? in a place called hell. Jesus comes and he raises a young ruler's daughter from the dead. He comes and raises a woman's, a widow's son from the dead. And here in John chapter 11, where you are, 
Let's look at this record. This is the familiar story of Lazarus. Christ heals Lazarus. Now notice in John chapter 11, I hope you're there, look at verse 38. The Bible lets us know that Jesus was grieved. The Bible lets us know in just a few verses prior to verse 38 that Jesus wept. Then in verse 38, if you would look at that, then Jesus again, groaning within himself, came to the tomb. Do you lay alive people in a tomb, yes or no? Not, I've never been to one that they did that. You're just a little weak in the knees, so why don't you go lay down in a tomb? No one does that. You don't lay anybody in a tomb unless they are. Come on, say the word. Okay, so you're on facts with me now. Look at it. It was a cave and a stone was laying against it. Wait a minute. The funeral is over. He's already been placed there. The stone, boy, this sounds familiar. The stone is placed there. This is over. They're just staying there to continue to grieve. And Jesus said, verse 39, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of him who was, who was dead, talking about Lazarus, said to him, Lord, hold on, in case you don't know, in case it got by you, this time there is a stench. That means he stinks in case you, he's rotten. He's been there long enough. Well, how long? The Bible says, look at it, for he has been dead, how many? Four days. Can you hold this number up? Come on, join with me. Not four minutes, not four hours, but four days. Is that dead, dead? By the way, there's no such thing as dead, dead, dead. You either are dead or you are not dead. Have I lost anybody? Okay, you're dead or you're not dead. This guy was dead. Look at verse 43 and 44. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. He who was dead, come out. His hands, his feet, wrapped with grave clothes and his face wrapped with a cloth. So he came out. I don't know how he came out, but I can only imagine, don't we like to vision things? If you're wrapped, do, can you, I don't know if you can walk. I don't know. The Bible doesn't say. I don't know if he hopped out. Is that where the Easter bunny hopping coming in comes from? I don't know. It doesn't matter. The point is he came out. Jesus said, come out. He comes out. He's still wrapped. But notice what Jesus says. It's not enough because he's still bound. He's not bound by earth. He's not bound by spiritual things, but he's bound by clothing and temporary bondage. Notice what he says. Unbind him and let him go. I wonder if Lazarus did a few laps. I wonder if they could even get to him and hold him and hug him. Because you know they're excited. But that guy had to have been taking a lap. I believe he might have been a little Pentecostal. <laughs> he might have ran a lap. Hey, would you have ran a lap? Would your mama have ran a lap? I guarantee you. Would your family? Oh, yeah. Why? Something that was dead is now alive. It's worth celebrating. The risen Christ is worth celebrating. Why? Once was, was dead is now made alive again. So take a lap. Here's the problem, though. We have disconnected ourselves from the facts. We get over the excitement really quick. By next week, most of you will have already moved on from Easter, Resurrection Sunday, and we will already be in a different mode set as far as even the service is content. 
Folks, we don't have any service. It's not worth showing up to. It's not worth spending time on. It's not worth studying if Jesus is still dead. I'm sorry, I'm not worshiping some good prophet or some man who made a claim that he didn't fulfill. I am worshiping the Son of God. It is important to note, though, that Christ performed these miracles. And by the way, these raising of the dead in front of witnesses, huge crowds of people, believers and non-believers saw it. This is not something that Jesus did behind closed doors with just two or three people who speculate what they saw. All of these people came out and said, hey, my loved one was once dead and now they're made alive and Jesus did it. You don't become a proponent and an eyewitness and a teller of this unless you actually witnessed what happened. No one goes around and celebrates something that isn't true. People, listen, this is real important because we love truth. Truth is the only thing that matters. No one would do what they're doing and what these eyewitnesses will do for a lie. Think about that. No one would do it. As we consider the resurrection of Christ and that it really happened, we have to ask ourselves, did Christ give any evidence of having power over death before his resurrection? Absolutely, we just learned that. The answer here is for his own resurrection from the dead is in total harmony with his life and his earthly ministry. It also would be in character with his actions. So the first fact is that Jesus had total power over death and life. Let me give you the second fact, and that is Christ declared ahead of time that he would rise from the dead. He did. I want you to look. Keep a bookmark in John chapter 11 because we're going to come back there. And go back a couple of pages, same book, to John chapter 2. John chapter 2, and look at verse 19 and verse 21. John chapter 2, verse 19 and 21. Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will rise it up. By the way, he wasn't talking about a physical temple. He was talking about himself. He goes on record. Guess what? That meant nothing to them in the moment. But after he did on the third day, guess what? You think their mind went back here? You think it went back there and all of a sudden, whoa, what he said was true. Look at verse 21. Of the same chapter. But he was speaking concerning the temple of his body. I've already told you that. Go ahead and find Mark now. Let's look at, let's do, we're doing some investigative work. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So we got to go to Mark now. So back up a little bit and go to Mark chapter 8. We're on the truth, we're on the search for truth, not subjective. But factual truth. And let's look at what the Word of God says very quickly. I, I won't have time to look up them all. I wish I did, but we don't. Luke, uh, Mark chapter 8, and look at verse 31. He began to teach them, The Son of God must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed. And after that, three days, what's those next two words? Yeah. He just wrote that. That's true. Mark wrote that. In order to get the whole picture of the cross and the empty tomb, you've, you've got to read all the Gospels And all of them harmonize. That means they are unified. But here's the thing. It's different if you write something and it's not true. It's a whole different story when you write something 
and then it becomes true. Then the writings are true. At this point, they're kind of wondering, okay, I hear you. What is that to us? We have hindsight. We can look back on this, thankfully, and see that this is true. He said, hey, you destroy this temple. I'm going to rise it up again. They're going to want to kill me. Everyone's going to come against me, all the religious leaders, even those who I came into my own, and my own received me not, the Jews. But I'm going to live again. Look at Luke chapter 24. Join me in Luke chapter 24, and let's look at this as we're on the search for evidence and historical facts. Luke chapter 24, and look at verses 6, 7, and 8. This is after the resurrection of Christ. They've seen the empty tomb. They're beginning to talk amongst themselves. More is being heard. More is being told. The word is getting out. In verse 6, he is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was still in Galilee? Oh, oh, let's look back. Let's remember what he said because he's not here. Wait a minute. Didn't he say something about that? He did. Verse 7. The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words. Remember them now because his words are true. He's done it. He's done what he said he would do. Christ made it clear that he would lay down his life in death and that he would give up his life freely as a payment for our sins, but then he made it clear that he had the power to take his life back again. The Bible says in John 10, this is on the screen, verses 17 and 18, Therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down myself. I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it up again. I receive this command from my Father. May I say to you that no religious leader has ever done this. Not Muhammad, not Confucius, not Joseph Smith, not any of them. Only Jesus Christ dared to make this kind of promise. Kill me and I'll live again. Why did he make that promise? Because he could do it. He's the only one he could do it, who could do it. That is why. So my friend, before you go and make any outrageous claims, make sure you have the facts to back it up. Jesus did. Now I'm going to tell you something. This is why I'm a big proponent of Bible learning and Bible teaching. Is because you can actually learn something and it's based on truth and not just subjective hearing. It's not based on some false ideology. It's based on truth. And even if, even if another man did promise to rise from the dead, it would have no credence because the decayed remains of all the founders, I said all of them, of all the founders of all the world's religious system still occupy a grave. I don't want to worship. I'm not going to worship some dead guy. That's no power at all. I want to put my faith and trust and have in a person who actually accomplished what they said they would. Christ's tomb is empty, folks. He wasn't trying to catch anybody off guard, by the way. That's why he told them before it even happened. If this was all a hoax, he would have not made it clear as he intended to do. And this brings me to my next fact. And the third fact is this. Those in leadership were motivated to stop it from happening. 
So do what you must. They were motivated in Jesus' day to stop it. And there are people today motivated to stop it from happening. You can't. You can try, but you won't. Because we have a risen Savior. Now, in your handout, if I could point out a little bit of a correction. On the screen, it is correct. But in your handout, I wrote the wrong reference. That's my fault. I put that together. It says Luke. It's not Luke. Can you scratch that out? There is no 27 chapters in Luke. And so it's Matthew 27, and let's look at it together. Can we? Matthew 27. I hope you still have a bookmark in John 11. We'll come back there. But Matthew 27. In case you went home looking for Luke 27. You'll be looking for a long time because it doesn't exist. Luke 27, Matthew 27, there I go, I go saying it again. Matthew 27, would you look at verses 62 through 66? This is Matthew 27. The next day, verse 62, following the day of preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees gathered together before Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that deceiver, saying, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. See, even everyone's remembering it. They just don't want to deal with it. Look at verse 64. Therefore, command. So let's make sure. Because just in case, just in case, what are you so concerned about just in case? If you don't believe it at all, what are you concerned about? Let it open. Leave it wide open. If you're not concerned about this, if you don't think there's any validity to this, what are you fretting over? I'm going to tell you, truth is truth. And when he spoke truth, it resonated with their spirit. And they couldn't get away with it. They couldn't get away from it. Look at it. Hey, let's command that the tomb be made secure on the third day. Oh, oh, let's make sure on the third day. Lest the disciples come by night and steal him away. And then tell the people, he has risen from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, you have a guard, go your way. You have a watch. You have a guard. You can have it. Go your way. Make it as secure as you can. I don't care. Do what you must. Do what you think is best. Do it. So they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and posting the guard. Christ made it clear, folks, ahead of time what he intended to do. And now his enemies had every opportunity to try and prevent it. Notice that they had a joint effort here in Matthew 27. There was effort by the religious and political leaders of the day to ensure that no claim could ever be made concerning the resurrection of the dead. They didn't want egg on their face. So they placed Roman guards at Jesus' grave. And after the resurrection, the leaders bribed the soldiers to even say that the, the Jesus' disciples came by night while they were asleep and stole his body. What? So all this is to stop it. All of this is fabricated. Why would you lie to stop a lie? Why would you make all this up if it's just a lie? It takes care of itself. Why even bother if it's not true? So they were all asleep. That's what they're proposing. All the soldiers are asleep. I'm talking about tough as nail Roman soldiers. And all of a sudden... 
these group of men rolled the stone away. And by the way, the stone is known to be about four tons. This is about three or four cars worth. So men are able, in the middle of the night, on their own, roll this away and carry a bo body out? No. And even after the resurrection, all they had to do to stop out Christianity, to stop this in its track, to nullify it, to absolutely eradicate this, is to produce the body of Jesus. By the way, his body was produced. They just wanted him dead. And he produced his body, but it wasn't dead. It was alive. And all of this happened in a geographical area that they had complete political power and motivation to do it. The Roman government was so oppressive, but they couldn't. Let me give you the fourth fact, and that is multiple eyewitnesses saw the risen Christ. You're in Matthew, I still believe. Look at Matthew chapter 28, if you're still there, and look at verses 8, 9, and 10. Again, I will not look up all these verses, but they are factual. They are evidence of this, and I will paraphrase them for you, but we won't have time to look them all up. Look at verse 8. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. The women went to the tomb first. It's empty. He's not here. He's risen. That's what they learned. And as they went, notice to tell the disciples, suddenly Jesus met them saying, Greetings. What? They came and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go tell my brothers to go into Galilee, and there they will see me. Jesus wasn't wanting to keep this under wraps, and by the way, neither should you. Jesus is wanting this to be told. Why? Because it's true. We're not asking you, no one's asking you, not even God himself is asking you to go and be a proponent of a false lie, to tell something that's untruth. But what a proclamation we have, and there were eyewitnesses in his day. And we're not talking about one or two people that said we saw him. We're not talking about people who said, well, we're pretty sure that it was him. It looked a whole lot like him, but we're not real sure. No, person after person said they saw him and talked to him, knowing that it could cost them their life if they had seen him. And they gave specific details about this. Let me give you a few. Christ appeared to Mary Magdalene first, then to a group of ladies that had come to the tomb, then to Simon Peter, then to the two men on the road to Emmaus. Then to ten of his disciples. Then to all of them again with Thomas there at that time. Then he appeared to over 500 believers at one time. And then he appeared to his brother James, by the way. Jesus had four brothers and unnamed sisters. James, Judas, Joseph, and Simon. And they were non-believers. They were non-believers during Christ's earthly ministry. And then Jesus also appeared to Paul, Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote 13 books of the New Testament. And it wasn't one of these. I think I saw an angel at the foot of my bed last night. You think you saw? Well, who saw it with you? Well, no one. Well, where's the evidence? Where is the facts that it actually happened? Uh, don't you know uh, you can eat some greasy food and pepperoni really late at night, pepperoni pizza, and don't you know you can have some wacko dreams? It will do it. 
But here when we're talking about Jesus, we're talking about tons of corroborating witnesses gave detailed accounts. I, I told you earlier that I love investigations. I love that stuff. I eat it up. And I love that stuff because they based it on evidence to prove who did it. I love all types of investigations. I, I love the investigations uh, about uh, the Holocaust and did Hitler make it really out alive? JFK? I'm a huge JFK conspirator. Every time I've seen them all, I've read them all. I love Abraham Lincoln. I, 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 I love all that stuff. I've read everything I can find about Abraham Lincoln. I love that stuff. Why? Because they're trying to document what really happened and they're trying to navigate through all the conspirators to actually get to the truth. Sometimes you have to come to a conclusion that we're not real sure. But that's not one of them here. Do you know that if there's a crime or a hoax, when you go to investigating, they'll let you know. The investigators, the inter interrogators will do this. The more people that are involved in the crime, the more easy it is to uncover it. Now, if there's just one person involved in the crime, that is very hard to uncover. If I was to only tell one of you a secret, just one of you, and I'd have to pick the right one of you because some of you aren't good at keeping a secret. But if I was able to tell just one of you, we probably could keep a secret from the rest of you. But if I was to tell all of you the same secret, I guarantee you, you'd go home, maybe Facebook or even casual ca uh, conversation outside in the community, you'd let it out. Why? The more people that know and find out about it, the more that it's talked about. That's what happened here in biblical times. That's why Jesus didn't just appear to people behind closed doors. That was personal and intimate. That was for a great reason so that those men and those women would become emboldened and that they would become courageous uh, proclaimers of the truth and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. But he didn't stop there. He let hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of others see him risen from the dead. Why? Because it's truth. We have nothing to hide. And any Evidence for Jesus' resurrection was open to investigation and a challenge. Paul said when he was investigating it and when he had seen the risen Christ, Paul said in his writings that there were still many eyewitnesses that were alive in his day. Go talk to them. So my friend, if you want truth, then you better check with the eyewitnesses and listen to the recorded words of those who actually have gone on record. So I'm asking you, you don't have to, please, don't take my word for it, but take the truth. Take the truth and allow the truth to change you. When you're doing some investigation when there's just one person involved in the crime, it may take a long time to crack that nut. But when there are several people involved in the crime, right, Christian? You can get them separated and you can get them in different rooms. And by the way, there's no secret to it. You can get them to known as the phrase to roll over on the other person. You can say, well, hey, Joe, next door, Sally is just spilling the beans. He is? Yeah, he's saying that you did it. Well, I didn't do it. He did it. And now you got people pointing fingers, and all of a sudden, all the truth starts coming to the surface, and you can start making sense of this hypothesis and this stupid, ridiculous story that they told. Why? Because when you get more people involved, somebody is going to say, listen to this now. I'm not willing to die for a lie. 
Don't send me to jail. I'm not going to jail for that idiot. I was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. I was just happened to be in the car, but I told him not to do it. It wasn't my gun. It wasn't my thing. I didn't want to do it. I tried to get out, but they wouldn't let me. And before I knew it, it all happened. And here I am before you. I didn't do it. Not one person, not one said, you know, we took him. Not one person said, you know what, he's still dead. Not one person said, you know what, it's all a lie. Not one person. So what did they do? They tried to cover up and forget about it. So they have become silent about the matter. Can I challenge you as a believer today, if you're saved and you know Jesus Christ, what is keeping you silent about the resurrected king? If it's a lie, stay quiet. But if it's truth, proclaim it. And these eyewitnesses did that. They weren't part of a secret society. And even after all of this investigation, and even after uh, they went hidden in an upper room, and Jesus came to them, and they're like, hey, man, this thing is real. This really happened. Jesus said it. Now we believe it. We've seen it with our own eyes. We felt him with our own hands. We've seen him. We've ate with him. This is miraculous. You know what they did? They left that place and went right back in the same place that they crucified Jesus and beat Jesus and took care of Jesus, and they went back and started proclaiming the truth. Why? For a lie? No, because they weren't concerned about getting jailed. They weren't concerned about live, uh, losing their life. Many of them were beheaded. Many of them died horrible deaths, but they did it because they attested to the fact that Jesus was alive and they had seen him. And so my friend, I conclude with this question and worship team, come on. What does the resurrection of Christ mean to you and me? So while they're moving, go back to John chapter 11. And let's answer this as we conclude. Because really, I can say it's fact, but you don't have to believe it's fact. But we have to get to the logical part of it because any reasonable person cannot deny the facts of all of this. It doesn't mean you have to believe it, but you can't deny the facts of it. So what does it mean to you and I? Because that's what you need to leave with. What am I going to do with it? To me, logically, it would make sense that if a man defeated death and rose from the grave, then he is the one that I want to go to to interpret to me what it means. So I can't come to you to interpret what it means. I must go to the author of it. I must go to the one who actually did it because you haven't died and rose again on the third day. You didn't do it. You're not the sinless, spotless lamb of God, but Jesus is, and he did. So you must go to him. And so logically, it only makes sense. And Jesus Christ, right before he raised up Lazarus from the dead, made it very clear just so we leave with clarity of this thought. Look at John chapter 11. Go back there and look at verse 25. And 26. Jesus said to her, hope you're there and not just listening. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die spiritually. Do you believe this? 
That is what you must leave with. You must answer that. Do you believe it? Not do you believe it for me, not do I believe it for you, not do you believe it because your mom and dad do, not because you believe some religious entity or institution, but do you believe what Jesus' claims were? I want to give you these thoughts, and here it is. Christ and the empty tomb means that we too can defeat death, and we too can have life, wait a minute, eternal, everlasting life. We're not talking about physical life. Come on in and get behind me. Yep, that's fine. We're not talking about physical life. By the way, do you remember Adam and Eve? The Bible told them, God told them, if you eat of this, you shall surely die. By the way, don't you know that they ate of that fruit and none of them kicked over dead immediately, did they? No, what death was he talking about? Spiritual. So my friend, we're not trying to give you physical life today. You already have that. And if you don't have that, we're going to call 911 for you. You need spiritual life. And because Christ died for our sins and because he was risen again on the third day in that empty tomb, this changes everything. And what that means is because if we believe what he said is true, if we put our faith and trust in that, we too can have eternal everlasting life. But it's not an automatic thing. I wish it was. I wish I could just (laughs) clap my hands and all of you would go, saved! It's not unrealistic or it is unrealistic, and it's kind of unreasonable. You've got to make a choice. Here's the thing. If you go to a store and you've made a purchase and you go to the store and you go back to the store and you go up to the counter and you're like, hey, I want to return this. Here's my receipt. I want to exchange this. They're going to direct you. If you don't know where it's already at, they're going to direct you and tell you to go to the exchange counter. They're not going to let you do it at the front. They're not going to let you do that. You're going to have to go to where that actually takes place. And by the way, you got to go to the place where all the returns happen and no one ever debates it. No one ever stood in Walmart and go, I don't want to go to the return department. You do it. Why? Because you know it's true and it's fact. None of you, none of you would go to get a job And when you go to get a job, you usually have an interview. And usually it's either a supervisor, the boss, or a director, or someone like that. Someone who's in management usually is the one who does the interview, but you don't go to the job, the possible job, and go to say, hey, I just want to be uh, interviewed by one of the employees. I'm sorry, that's not the way it works. If you want a job here, you've got to go through the process, and this is the process of our interview, and everyone would say, okay, why? Because you know it's based on truth and fact, and that's the way it's done. No one would go to a mechanic and say, hey, I'd like to have plastic surgery. Not your auto mechanic, you wouldn't. Hey, I'd like to have plastic surgery. My nose is this way. I'd like for it to go that way. You wouldn't do that. Why? Because you know that's not the way it's done, and you know that that person can't help you with that issue. You wouldn't go to the pharmacy and have the person at the counter necessarily write the prescription, you'd want to make sure a pharmacist and a doctor had something to do with them pills that you can't even read and the prescription that he wrote on some notepaper that you can't read as well and scribble down. You have no idea what's inside that pill box until they give it to you. You're just hoping it's correct, but you have put your faith and trust in the pill giver. Why? Because that's the way it's done. And you believe it based on truth and what you have been told. You believe it for yourself. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's no other way. If you want eternal spiritual life in a heaven as a home, then you must come through Jesus. That's the only way. And here's the thing. A person must make a choice whether or not they will believe on Jesus Christ or whether they will deny or reject him. You must make a choice. John 3, 16 and verse 36 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. 
Jesus said in verse 36, he who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. What am I saying? Here it is. Your choice determines your future. What kind of future do you have? My friend, if your choice is not based on the truth of God's word and what he's done through his son, Jesus Christ, then your future is not one of hope. It's one of hopelessness. It's not one of life. It's one of eternal death. Not eternal life, but eternal death. So what choice will you make today? Will you give your heart and life to Jesus today based on the facts? Because they're, they are evident. It's true. And because Christ is risen, it changes everything. And I trust and pray that your life today has been changed through Jesus Christ. With every head bowed and every eye closed, with every head bowed and every eye closed, do you know Christ as your Lord and Savior today? Do you know him? Maybe you've come to many services like this or whatever, but you have never given your life to Christ. But you recognize in this moment, you recognize at this time that you haven't put your faith and trust in the everlasting one. You just thought it was a good story. Something that people came to watch maybe a drama for, sung about. But you didn't realize that all these claims were true, but now you know. Would you give your life and heart to Christ today? Would you allow Jesus, through the finished work of the cross, forgive you of all your sins and to give you an eternal home with him in heaven? Would you receive that today? Everybody has a choice, either receive it or reject it. My question to you is, if you're not saved, if you haven't been delivered, if you haven't been forgiven, will you give your life to Jesus? With every head bowed and every eye closed, please no looking. I just want to speak to you just a second. Say, Pastor, that's me. I realize that I'm a sinner. I realize the payment that Jesus made for me, and I won't, by my own choosing, to give my heart and life to Jesus. And I want to do that right now. Pastor, that's me. I want to do that right now. If that's you, with no one looking, just me, would you raise your hand real high where I can see it, where I can pray for you, acknowledge you, and pray for you? And when I do, you can put it down. Is there anyone in the service? Anyone? Raise your hand real high. Pastor, that's me. I want to be saved today. I want to be saved. Anyone? God bless you. Anyone else? You can put it down. Thank you. Anyone else? God bless you. Anyone else? When you raise it up and I acknowledge it, you can put it down. You don't have to hold it up. Anyone else? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. I see you. For you that raised your hand, here's what I want to give you. The Bible says, for with the mouth confession is made and with the heart we believe. Will you right now in your seat where you are confess? Say, what is that? You know what confess means. It means to tell something. What am I confessing? Confess your sins. See, pastor, I have to name them all. You won't remember them all. But you could say something like this, like I did. Jesus, please, I ask you, and I know you will, forgive me of all my sins. Would you do that right now where you are? Jesus, forgive me of all my sins and give me what you promised, eternal life. I believe it and I receive that from you today. I receive eternal life. And I believe it because your word tells me so. Do you believe that today? If you do, and if you did, the 
Bible says, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. My friend, what I would say to you is welcome to the family of God if you meant it. This is what salvation is. Putting your faith and trust in Jesus as your only hope to heaven. For the rest of you who didn't raise your hand as believers, will you go now and be great eyewitnesses? Go and tell others what you have learned, what you have seen, what you know to be true. If you're a Christian, what you know to be true and what you personally believe. Don't be silent. There are many others around you who need hope and help, and they need to hear the truth. Father, thank you for the word of God today. Thank you for the truth. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Okay.
sins are forgiven. My future is heaven. I praise God for what He's done. I praise God for what He's done. Hey. Amen. Good job, guys. Well, in Jesus' famous words, it's finished. Amen to that. I love this song. I praise God for what he's done. Amen. Good job, girls. So for today, that's it for us. Um, we are so happy you guys decided to spend Resurrection Sunday with us. And as you guys go out and you have your Easter egg hunts and all the, the food you're probably getting ready to go eat, I pray that you don't forget the reason we're celebrating today. And that is because it's done. So you guys have a great week. We can't wait to see you back here next Sunday. We love you guys. God bless. Happy Easter. Good job, guys.